How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the More We Know podcast. I am your host, Mir. The More We Know podcast is a mentorship platform focused for Gen Zs and millennials looking to accomplish and learn more in their life who might not be privileged enough to have access to a mentor. Today, we have a really fun and amazing and exceptional guest that I'm excited to share with you guys, who is Deirdre Lovejoy, aka also DD, who has had an illustrious acting career, has been in the industry now for some time, and I am a personal fan who has been falling in love with the character from The Blacklist, who is just an amazing character and seeing her work with James Spader. It was it was such a progression and an exciting time. And I'm so honored and privileged to have her on as our mentor today. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much, Mir. I'm really stoked to be here. I'm excited to spend the next 30 minutes with you. Thank you so much. And, you know, let's just kick it off right away. So obviously people can look you up on Google and we can see that you're a phenomenal actress. You've been, you know, very well known for your role as assistant state's attorney, Rhonda Perlman on HBO's The Wire, your other roles like Heather Taffet, who was the serial killer on Fox. And, you know, of course, NBC's The Blacklist, which is a very famous show now. But before all that, can you walk me through your background growing up? Were your parents in the world? Like, What made you want to actually become an actress? Oh my goodness. What a great question, Mir. I come from a small town in northern Indiana in in the States, and I grew up doing community theater with my mother when she would go after work to do small town productions of musicals and things like that. And that was how I started. That was my introduction to the theater. I did my first play when I was in fifth grade. It was a Tennessee Williams play called Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And from that moment, I just loved being on the stage. And I don't know that I knew right then what I was going to do, but certainly by the time I was in high school, I knew that I was going to try to be an actor in some way, shape, or form. I progressed from northern Indiana to southern Indiana and went to school at a wonderful theater program called at the school called the University of Evansville. And from there, I got my bachelor's degree in theater. And then I moved to New York City and got my master's degree from NYU. And I started plugging away. My first jobs were primarily in the theater. I'm a theater actor. And my first job was at a rather large venue here in New York City called Shakespeare in the Park, which is a summer event for people that's free Shakespeare for anyone who wants to come. And I was, uh, you know, I did a production of Henry the Fourth, and I was off to the races. I got my agent right out of graduate school, started plugging away from there. That journey is awesome. It's just, it's awesome to go back as a flashback, but that industry is extremely challenging. There's so much rejection. There's so much fear. There's so much doubt. It's so competitive. You know, how did you stay motivated? Because I'm sure it wasn't all sunshine, right? There was, so, there was a lot of rejections that came on the way, I'm sure. The industry is absolutely brutal and very unforgiving. And I say that with a great joy in my heart. <laughs> I love what I do and I love what I, you know, I love the people that I work with, but it is not from the faint of heart and it can really wear you down and you hear no proportionately a lot, a lot more than you hear yes. So you have to have that internal ability to just keep getting back up and keep showing up and doing the next right thing. I think my either naivete or tenacity was my strong suit when I was younger because I just didn't, no didn't phase me. I thought, okay, well, you're saying no, but let's look for the yes. You don't like it, somebody will. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept plugging away. It's an industry that likes you to leave. So you have to find ways to keep yourself healthy within it. And that's what I've always tried to do. Now, when you were in your early 20s, going through different auditions and, and trying out different things, did you have any mentors along the way? I sure did. I had a mentor right out of college named John David Lutz, who literally wrote all the checks to pay for my admission to graduate school auditions. I didn't realize they cost money. And back in the day, they were very, you know, a little expensive. I didn't have a lot of money. And he wrote the checks for me to audition. And I didn't realize what a gift that was at the time. I didn't think I needed school or any training whatsoever. I thought I was just going to go out and tackle the world. And little did I know how much I had to learn. So I was very grateful that he along the way did that. And, and certainly throughout my professional career, I've had wonderful colleagues that have been beacons to me and certainly mentors in addition to that. Absolutely. I think, I think people can't survive without a hand up, at least a hand 
alongside to navigate uncharted waters. I relied very heavily on my peers from graduate school. There's an actress called Cameron Mannheim, who is a star of Law and Order now and has done many, many television shows throughout her career. Cameron and I are dear friends. She was in my class at NYU. And Cameron wasn't always uh, rich and famous and multi dimensional in terms of her work experience. She got a lot of doors shut on her as well. And, and so we went through that together. You have to find a way to stay mentally fit. I, I know I said that before, but specifically that means, you know, not making your career the focus of your of your life. You have to find other ways to enrich your soul that aren't dependent on other people. I think that for me came from my peers and colleagues and people I was working with in plays and directors that I experienced along the way in the theater that certainly showed me the way. I think you just hit the nail on the head there too, which is the the mental toughness aspect. Because I think unfortunately in our generation of Gen Zs, we really struggle with that aspect. It is really tough to go through the rejection and, and the pitfalls and and the self-doubt that comes with it. Especially, you know, we're talking about the acting world, but in general, if you want to be an entrepreneur, or if you want to pursue anything of any variance of excellence, it does get really challenging. And our generation is so hooked to the Instagram world, which is where we see everyone with makeup. They don't see the behind the scenes of what life is really like without that. And and you just hit the nail on the head of having that toughness. So to hear where you've gotten in your career and to be able to say, hey, you got to have that grit and keep going is, is refreshing. Well, it's very important, too, because hearing no can be taken as a reflection on your self-worth in this business. And so that's why attention to being sort of, you know, well-balanced is so crucial because you can go off the deep end in any business if you're looking for approval from other people, but especially in the acting world, if you're looking for validation, which is only human, which is what we only what we all want. We all want val- to be validated and recognized and and complimented. Unfortunately, in my line of work, that's not what you get on a daily basis when you're first starting out. You have to throw a lot of lines into the ocean and just wait for the things to bite. And that can take a long time. So you have to have patience and faith in yourself. Now, obviously, you've had a phenomenal career now being on you know, NBC and HBO Max and, and hit cinema movies. But when did you actually catch your first big break, right? Because you might have small roles that come in and, and things that come. But when did you catch your break where you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm really doing this? Oh, my goodness. Well, Mir, I guess it's nice to know I have made it. I wasn't aware. I just <laughs> I just keep plugging along. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm always looking for the next job, which is what we do. And you never stop doing that. That's, you know, I'm currently in between seasons of The Blacklist. We're going to do another season next year, which is really wonderful. But I consider myself at the moment currently unemployed. So <laughs> it's, it never, ever stops is what I'm trying to say. And in, 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 in 20 years, you know, knock wood, I'll still be doing this. And in 20 years, I'll still be, you know, having to push out there and, and, and try to find the next job. Uh, I just talked about that for so long that I forgot your question. <laughs> Well, no, no, I think, you know, that, that you really tied right into the question, honestly, which is, you know, how, how you caught your big break. But interestingly enough, you brought up an important point that's even a, a divergence, which is the comfort level. It seems like you never get comfortable. Like, it seems like you could get a new movie tomorrow and you never get comfortable. Well, actually, I do have a new movie and I am shooting it in the fall and I'm still not comfortable. Absolutely. And there are different levels of comfort. Let's say that uh, I'm certainly not restless, irritable or discontent. But I am having to always put myself out there and be visible and have, maintain a profile on social media or, you know, keep that propaganda going at, at full steam all the time so that people know where you are and when you are. You know, I will say that you talked about catching a break. And for me, of course, I think the big break was The Wire and being part of such a, you know, an amazing, iconic, important piece of work that, you know, we certainly didn't know what it was at, at the time initially the years have proven that the the that body of work is really not only held up but has um, sort of you know improved with age 
So I'm, I'm really proud to have been part of that and not to toot my own horn in, in any way, but not a lot of actors get to have been a part of something so special. I say that with complete humility because it's such a crapshoot. You know, I just happen to be there. It's a show that's now taught in classes all over the world and Harvard and Yale teach sociology classes that are, that use the wire as a, as a launching pad. So I think that's a wonderful thing to have been part of and to have out there in the world. And I'm very proud of it. I think it still speaks for itself. Yeah, it's definitely, you've, you've made your mark with that one for sure. And and I want to talk a little bit about The Blacklist because that's exciting. But beforehand, how did you actually get the role with HBO and, and to be on The Wire? I'm sure it was extremely competitive. How did you actually get the role? You know what? It really was competitive. And I remember the audition so vividly, which is unusual because I do a lot of auditions. But I remember that I didn't think I had a snowball's chance in beep to get the job. I thought I knew there were only two women in this series. I knew it was a new HBO series. I knew that one of the women was uh, of color. So that meant one white girl. And there were are a lot of really talented actresses in New York City, and they were all there. So I think I just caught my break. I think I walked into that room and they didn't quite know what they were looking for. And somehow I was it. It was my day that day because I didn't do anything differently than I've done in a million auditions, but it was just, it was just meant to be. So I believe that about jobs in this industry. I think you really can't get rid of the ones that are, are yours. And you know, if it's not yours, it's, it, there's nothing you can do to get it. So, so you auditioned for The Wire. What was the feeling like when you left the audition? Was it, were you like, I got this? I walked out of that room and I remember I I was quitting smoking and I had a patch on and, and when I was in the room and I put my microphone on and as I put my microphone on, it revealed my smoking patch. And, and so we had a nice little chat about my, you know, attempting to quit smoking and the reading went really well. Because I I knew there was no chance for me to get the job, so I had no nerves whatsoever. And Clark Johnson at the end said, nice read, a great read. He said, great read. I said, thank you. And I got up and I left. And then I got a call back, which floored me. And I went to the call back and sure enough, three weeks went by and I got the call that I had booked the job. I didn't have to test, even though it was a, you know, a new role on a net cable show. I didn't have to do any sort of shenanigans in that regard. It was just mine. I remember being in shock, <laughs> quite frankly. I'm just being completely honest with you. Yes. I didn't I think that. I had a chance at the role and uh, luckily I got it. But I think there's an important lesson there, which I just love that you stated. You you just said you didn't think you had a chance at it. And I'm sure you were going about your life and doing your thing. And now fast forward, when you look back, you know, hindsight is 2020, but this is being taught in history books. This is a, a famous show that everyone talks about. So you thought that you didn't have a chance of getting it. And now look, when you look back, doesn't that teach us a lesson about life on a broader level, which is when you think you don't have it or when you don't have money or when you don't have the relationship or whatever it might be, it can work out in, in magical ways. You just have to do the next right thing. Every single day, you just have to get up and do the next right thing. And sometimes it's one thing at a time for me. You know, if it's a string of auditions in a day, I sometimes, you know, if I'm lucky enough to have that, you just have to do one at a time. Or if there's nothing in your horizon and, you know, you're, you've got things that aren't pleasant to do, sometimes you just have to get through that one thing and you can get over whatever mental hump is there and be into smooth sailing. But it is just about showing up. It's just about suiting up and showing up, I think, on a daily basis. And that consistency pays off eventually. I needed that one. Even for myself, I know the listeners are going to love that, but I needed that too for myself. That was awesome. I appreciate that. Now, how does someone like you and, and your caliber handle rejection? Well, I hope gracefully, but I think it varies from job to job. I don't set myself up for rejection, so I don't feel like I have to deal with it a lot. I treat each audition as my part of the experience, and I do the audition, and I send it away, and then I'm done with it. So I don't consider myself rejected. (laughs) 
Perhaps I should, hmm, maybe I need to rethink that. Am I getting rejected every single time? Oh, no. <laughs> That's devastating. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I just try to let send it off and, and forget about it. So, that, um, you know, if the phone rings, I'm thrilled. And if it doesn't, that's not my problem, not my issue. I, I've taken care of my part already. I've done my part. So I, I don't tag along to hearing back from people because that's setting yourself up for some heartache and pain right there. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you really focus on controlling what you can, which is showing up, doing your part, and the rest is not in your control, so you don't stress about it. That's right. And I always have to keep in mind that, you know, it's really hard to get isolated in our world today because we can sustain perfectly fulfilled lives from our computer desk and never go outside and feel like we're interacting with people. But it is really, really important to just suit up and show up and know that people want you to do well. They're on your side. They're wanting the tape to be good. They're wanting the audition to be good. They want to hire you. And so if you set yourself up with an atmosphere of generosity in that regard, I think it makes the whole journey a little bit softer. I'll tell you what, I think if we all had a little bit more of your mindset, we'd have less gray hairs, we'd have less stress. I mean, I think it's just a good way in a broader way to look at life too. I, I, I appreciate that side. I think that positivity is refreshing and especially for the audience here being the majority in their early 20s, we are such a stressed generation with just because we see everyone has a private jet on Instagram all of a sudden. Everyone just got the hit role. I mean, Instagram, again, it only shows us the good parts. And, and that's why I'm just so glad to hear from you and your perspective. You maintain that positivity nonetheless. It's amazing. Sometimes Instagram is nothing but propaganda. And by sometimes, I mean 100% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my own included. It's a, it's a professional tool for me. It's not a personal tool for me. And, and again, I, I really try to remove expectations because I feel like they are future resentments and they yeah. can really uh, provide you with a lot of, of heartache. Whereas if I am just putting my content out there and not engaging with the negative, I am saving myself a lot of strain and the stress you talked about, which is very serious. It's a very, very serious matter stress. I had a, a seizure disorder in 2009 and wound up in the hospital um, and unable to walk or talk by the end of that year from stress. And it was a long, slow climb back. I'm very serious about the subject. It's not anything to take lightly. Our bodies are rigorously connected to our minds. It's very important that you tend to your mental capacity because it's it's really what's operating this whole big computer and it requires the same sort of love and attention that our psyches do, you know? I'm glad you bounced back from that one, but two, again, the emphasis on stress being a real problem and it can really impact your health. How, how did you bounce back from that? Yeah. Well, that's a great question, Mir. A day at a time, to repeat our theme. it's uh, It was a matter of just doing the next thing. And I couldn't tell if it was the right thing or not. I just woke up every day and, and showed up. And time is a great healer. And eventually my faculties came back. You know, my health was restored fully after a lot of, a lot of work. But it was just showing up a day at a time. Because I didn't have a crystal ball. I, you know, none of us do. So the only thing within my control is I can devote myself 100% to talking to you right now. And when we hang up, I can go out and see a play and have my energies totally focused there. But I can enjoy that and all my projections about, about what's going on in the world and all my projections about my career and all my projections of negativity have to be kept at bay if I'm firmly rooted in the present moment. So that's kind of how I like to try to roll. Yeah. And I think that's a mindset that you've developed over your career, which I think I really hope the audience listens to a lot of the key takeaways there. And the mantra for this whole podcast for me is just showing up and, and you've already won 50% of the battle. So the fact that you're looking at a day to day is, is, is really amazing to, to transition here to, to the other side, you know, 
you are a, a amazing actor and you've had such a phenomenal career. And we talked about HBO, the wire. I do want to ask you, you mentioned a little bit about the blacklist uh, for starters, huge fan of the show. And what I loved about, uh, you know, Cynthia's role is Cynthia had a lot more screen time. I noticed in season nine. So, I mean, what's that transition been like? I noticed that you've become sort of a ongoing, almost, you know, main character within the blacklist with the amazing James Spader. Can you talk about that a little bit? I sure can because I love the blacklist. I love them behind the scenes. I love them in front of the scenes. I love the show. I have such enormous respect and admiration for James Spader and his work ethic. And that entire cast is quite phenomenal. And, and there have been some, you know, there are some departures this year that are Amir is leaving and, and Laura Sohn has left. And so that's a, a, a shake up. I love the screen time that Cynthia had this year. I'm hoping, looking forward to more next year, I'm hoping that she can step in and be a little bit more involved with the task force like she was this year. I, Anytime I get the opportunity to come and play, I'm delighted. Yeah, it it really is awesome, and you know that there was the one episode in season nine where I believe Cynthia was it the daughter that was going through something, and you know Cynthia went and approached Red about the situation for the first time. I saw the the face to face one on one that it was just you and Red, and I already knew at that point you Red does you a favor, you do him a favor. What was that episode like filming with James Spader? Terrifying. <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, I was shaking in my boots because I had some big scenes with Red. He's so scary. I mean, yeah. he's scary uh, on screen, you know, not in real life. It's such fun. That episode in particular was, was of course, a joy because I I had a lot to do. And it was about her family, which was, which was you know, some very fun stuff was revealed there as well. And I'm not, not pleasantly surprised, but I'm continually delighted delighted by how the minds of the writers of the blacklist work you know i i really appreciated all the behind the scenes and the backstory of cynthia's family and character that we got to learn in that episode that's amazing i love that yeah again you two uh, i loved watching you two just interact together and especially towards the end for the people that haven't seen it, it's a it's a, definitely a great episode to go watch now where, where do you see from what you can share the the future for cynthia's role the senator and and, and season 10 any look forwards that you could share with the audience here I wish that I could share lots of things with the audience beyond the fact that I'm as excited as they are to find out what's going to happen. And that's not me being coy. That is me just saying I have <laughs> no clue, no idea whatsoever. And I'm, and and I wish I did. I wish I had some secret I could share with you. I do not. I, you know, I honestly, frankly, I hope that Cynthia is back on the blacklist, but you never know. That show could, I don't, they could flash forward 10 years and have a whole new cast. Who knows? You know, <laughs> I, I, you never know, but we're, I'm hopeful that we'll see more of Cynthia next year and who knows what, what her involvement will be. I'm very hopeful for that. You know, having that refreshing face versus the ugly side of the cabal and things of like that. It was it was always exciting to have you uh, rep that. And how, and how did you end up getting the blacklist role? Was that the same sort of process as the HBO Wire? Did you have a you know? Did someone ping you to do that one? What was that process? You know what? My I started out in season two or three. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. You might be able to tell me. I I, I don't know. Two, Maybe it was two. And it was just supposed to be two or three episodes. And uh, it was a straight offer, which means I got a phone call wow. saying, would you like to do this show? And that rarely happens. But when it does, it's a joy because I know that they actually, you know, I say that with great respect, they, I think they held auditions for the part. And I think I still got the straight offer, which is a gift when it happened. So anyway, so I didn't have to go through the Michigas of auditioning for the blacklist. It, it landed in my lap. And to my surprise, they called the next year and the next year. And then the year after that, and the year after that. So it's always been incremental. I, they always sort of keep me on the edge of my seat, not unlike the fans, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, they don't necessarily tell me they're going to call, but the, but they usually call. So we'll find out, we'll find out together, you and I, because I have not a clue. Absolutely. Well, I'm really looking forward to season 10 and we really, really hope we see more of you because you were an amazing uh, treat in season nine. So looking forward to that. And you well, right. Oh, send ahead. a tweet, send a tweet to NBC. 
More Panda Baker, more Panda Baker. <laughs> hey, guys, if you're listening, please tweet that to NBC and the, and the Amazing Blacklist show because we need to see more of Panda Baker. She is an awesome character. And if you haven't watched her yet, go to the NBC app, go check out Blacklist, and, and go watch how amazing she's been in the show, especially interactions with Red, who is, like she said, very scary. So not I'm in person. Gonna... Not, not in person. Screen. In person, he's on screen. He is, but not in person. In person, James Spader is phenomenal. He's always been. He's 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 also another one of those legendary actors. Uh, yeah, what a career and what a the breadth of his work is really staggering. I I you know hats hats off to that man. What a career. What a career. It, it really has been amazing. And and you you told us at the start of the show you have a movie coming up in the fall. What what movie is coming up? Oh. I'm shooting a movie called Lily in Georgia, and it's uh, starring Patricia Clarkson. And it's a movie about Lily Ledbetter, who is the namesake of the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which was President Obama's first act that he officially signed when in office. And it, it guaranteed equal pay for the same job between men and women. Uh, and it's a biopic about Lily Ledbetter starring Patty Clarkson, and I'm playing her a lawyer. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's exciting. It's, uh, that's very exciting. It's, it's a great project, and I'm looking forward to it. That's amazing. And and where can the audience that's listening in, who's really enjoyed this episode with you, learn more about you, or, or check out your website, or, or roles that you've been in? Where can we follow you? Oh, you're sweet, Mir. My website is there. Although, uh, folks, I maintain it, so don't look for you know information <laughs> blasts every other day because you're not going to get. <laughs> <laughs> but follow me on Instagram. Do follow me on Instagram is the best way to keep up because I'm always blabbing about anything that I have coming up. Amir and I, Amir Arison and I did a, a live Instagram session uh, not too long ago. And hopefully some other people on the blacklist and I will get that together in the coming days to do more of that. And on Twitter, of course, but I'm not a big tweeter. So Instagram is really the best place. And there are links uh, in my Instagram bio to my website and stuff like that as well. Thanks a lot for asking me. Are your tweet. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, I, thank you so much for your time. This is such a gem and a privilege and an honor. And as a fan of watching you on the blacklist, I'm, I'm just so honored for the time that I had with you today. I will put all the links for Didi in the description below so you guys will see that if you didn't get it from her I'll post it in below so you guys will be able to go follow her there Didi what could you go you know as we close out here what could you go and tell your 21 year old self knowing what you know now about your career I like to ask at the end of the podcast your illustrious career you go back to 21 year old Didi what are you telling her oh it's such a great question Mir may I just say you really have given great interview today <laughs> thank you thank you well, it's, it's been it's really a pleasure interviewee. thank you so much thank you um, thank you i would tell my 21 year old self to relax and have fun and not not take everything so seriously that things are going to work out and they're going to work out the way they're going to work out whether or not i worry about it or not but as long as i keep showing up and do the next right thing, then I can forget about the result and just try to have fun and relax. I, honest to God, it sounds so simple, but that's what I would say. Don't stress. Don't stress. Sometimes the simple advice is the best advice. And I needed that for myself. Uh, I hope the audience can really appreciate that. Didi, you are such a pleasure to speak to and, and learn from. And that was really powerful. That hit me there. You know, I know how important it is to not stress. And you taught us a valuable life lesson within this podcast there. So I, I really appreciate your time today. And I appreciate the interview. This was really a, a, a treat, especially for Blacklist fans or fans of your work in general. It, it was really exciting to have you on. My pleasure, Mir. And um, I've had a great time here with you today. So I appreciate you. Thank you. That is Didi Lovejoy. Go check her out on HBO, on NBC. She has a new movie coming out in the fall. Go follow her on Instagram today. After you listen to this episode, please go follow her. She is amazing. One of the favorite people I've interviewed. Uh, and thank you guys so much. 